Alright, in tonight's video we're looking at how to construct a lab report. Um, this is especially aimed at students who are beginning advanced science in grade 9. Um, this will be your first exposure to lab reports in high school. So I'm going to show you a very good example of a grade 9 lab report, and then we'll take a look at a lab report as well that's uh, from later years in advanced chemistry. So here's an experiment that we will do later in the, in the semester called concentration of saturated solutions. You can tell the first part of a, of a lab report will be a, an attractive, descriptive title page. So in this lab report, there's a clear, big title of the report, and this student went to town in terms of decorating the report with various appropriate images that they took from the web, uh, including some solubility curves that we use in this unit. At the bottom of their report, they've identified themselves, I've crossed out their names, um, as well as the name of the course, um, the slot, the date that the experiment was done, and the date that the experiment was handed in. So that's, those are the components of a good title page. Clear title, some appropriate graphics, your names, both your name, the author's name, and if you're writing the report independently, you would put your name first, and then you'd put your partner's name after that. If you're writing it together, then just put the two names together. The order doesn't matter. Now, when I open the report up, turn to the first page in the lab report, the first thing I'm going to see will be a paragraph, as you can see here, a single paragraph. And we're going to call this an abstract. The abstract has approximately four parts. And the very first few sentences of the abstract, we should read something about the background of the experiment some background theories, some applications, ideas. So let's take a look. In, in many experiments, there are at least two substances being added together, solute and solvent. The solute is whichever substance is being dissolved. I won't read it all, but you can see this person is going through the um, definitions of, in terms of so making solutions. This experiment is on concentration of saturated solutions. So she's giving the background information about solutions. Second thing we should find when we read a good abstract is the purpose of the experiment. So why are we doing this experiment? So looking as we read through all of the background information, we see the phrase, the purpose of this experiment was to find the solubility of sodium chloride and sodium nitrate salts at room temperature. So there's a very clear statement of the purpose of the experiment. The third thing we should find in an abstract is a description of the procedure, the method. What did you do in the experiment? Now, we don't want a step-by-step -step recipe, but we do want some detail to communicate what you did in the experiment. So let's take a look. To do this experiment, five mils of water was added to a test tube, and a sample of five grams of either sodium chloride or sodium nitrate was added to the test tube. Rubber stopper was put on and shaken to dissolve as much as possible. Using a balance, the mass of an evaporating dish was taken. The solution was added, leaving behind any extra salt the mass was taken again. A Bunsen burner was used to heat up the solution and evaporate all of the water until only salt was left. The mass of the evaporating dish was taken. From this information, calculations were able to be made. So there's a description of their, of their experiment. It doesn't quite sound like a step-by-step -step, um, instructions, but you can clearly understand what that person did in the experiment. And at the very end of the abstract, the fourth and final part of the, of the abstract, we said at the in the second part that the purpose was to find the solubility of the salts. So at the very end, we should find the conclusion, the result. It should directly relate to the purpose. So if you read the last sentence, in the end, we found that the concentration of the saturated solution for sodium chloride was 32.842 grams per 100 milliliters. And for sodium nitrate, it was this. Now, there's a little bit of an issue there maybe with significant digits in those, in those answers, but that's a very clear um, conclusion at the end. Now, one last thing that might have been included, included here, in some experiments we, we collect class results, so you might state at the very end the class average for each of those things as well. So there's the abstract, the description of the background or theory, the purpose of the, of the experiment, the basic procedure of the experiment, and finally, the results that you found, okay, the specific results. The next section of a good lab report will be data and results tables. Data is anything that you measured in the experiments. Result is anything that you calculated in the experiments. And they're always set up like this in some kind of tabular format. 
Now a good table will have a title like this, table number one, data for finding the solubility. So I can just look at that title and see clearly what these numbers will represent. The second table, table two, results for finding the solubility. So good tables always have titles like that. Then there are clear descriptors in the table, mass of an empty dry evaporating dish with the units, grams. Some people put the units right here, some people put the units beside the numbers, either one is fine, but you must include the units in your tables when you have numbers like this. And then they've got all their data, they, they, record, they must have been using an electronic balance here for these masses with three decimal places, and they recorded all of the decimal places including zeros like that, which is very good to see. Then down below, we see the results of the, of the experiment, things that they calculated using the data up above, and at the very bottom, the concentration of their saturated solution. And again, you can see the units are included, and all of their uh, numbers are very clear and well formatted. So that's a very nice looking set of tables. The next section of a good report, these people have included some photographs that they took um, from using their cell phones during the experiment. That's not an absolutely necessary, but it is a nice addition. It also helps later when they um, want to study for, for the experiment or they want to study for a test or later we do a big sludge test and you want to remember what you did in earlier experiments, it's good to have these pictures to remind you of what you did. Underneath it are sample calculations. This is definitely a requirement in all reports where you did a calculation. Now a good example calculation, let's take a look. They've got a description of what they're finding, the mass of the saturated solution. They've got a formula for finding that, mass of evaporating dish with saturated solution minus mass of empty evaporating dish. So a description of what they're calculating, a formula for what they're calculating, and then they put the actual numbers from their tables earlier, and they get the result. And that result, 8.380, should be the result that we find right here back in the table, 8.380 grams of saturated solution. So there's the sample calculations. Each of the results in the earlier table should have a sample calculation. Down below, they also knew the actual values for these um, quantities. They knew what the solubility or concentration of saturated solutions should be, and they calculated their percent errors, which they'll later discuss in their conclusions. So the percent error calculations are also shown, there, which is nice to see. They've also given a nice reference there. True values um, are from the solubility charts. Now next, these people went way, way overboard in terms of a conclusion and discussion. This is an amazingly well-written conclusion and discussion. I don't mean overboard in an insulting way, but they went much beyond what was expected for grade 9 advanced science. The conclusion and discussion, they, what, you want to, what I want to read in this, in this part of your report, is a restatement of your results. So in the end, we found the concentration of the saturated solution to be 32.842 grams per 100 mils. They compare it to the true value, which they got from their solubility curves, and they also talk about the percent errors in here. They also talk about the sodium nitrate, the other chemical they were using. So there you can see they're stating their results. If there is a true value, they're mentioning that as well. Sometimes there'll be a class average, and you can compare your result to the class average. Was it, was it high? Was it low? You might calculate the percent difference from, your, from the class average as well. The next part of the conclusion comes the discussion. So after mentioning your results and comparing them to truth and showing percent error, you, you discuss things. Now what you want to discuss here is you might discuss the reasonableness of your results. Did they, were they close to the true values? And what, but more specifically, the thing I really want to read here are descript discussion of errors both errors that you actually occurred, that actually occurred in your experiment, so things that you actually committed. Maybe during the experiment you, you let some salt spit out of the dish as you were evaporating it with your Bunsen burner. So you would mention that here. In addition to mentioning the error, you would also hopefully talk about how that error would affect your results. You want to talk about eventually whether it would make the result too high or too low, and you would provide an explanation of why that is. You wouldn't just claim that the result will be too high or too low. You'd explain, um, based on your calculations, how the error affects your final result. 
Now these people went into great detail and good detail. So this is again, these, these are students who are very good not only in science but also in, in uh, English and they wrote a really, really nice um, conclusion and discussion. Normally a conclusion discussion would be approximately a third of a page long, maybe half of a page. These people wrote a full page of conclusion and discussion, which is, which is amazing to see. So there's a basic experiment. So a title page, your abstract with its four parts, data tables and results tables with titles and units shown and everything labeled nicely and formatted very nicely, sample calculations for each of the results that were in your, t in your results table. You might include pictures like this, and finally a conclusion and discussion. Now let's take a look at a, at a report from an advanced chemistry class. This is a grade 11 advanced chemistry class. We do this in grade 10 for, at Grant Park. So students in the very next year would have done this, this experiment. So this is a, from AP Chemistry, finding the percent mass of copper in a sample of brass using colorimetry as a technique. So there's, again, a descriptive title. They've chosen to use pictures that they actually took in their experiment rather than just taking things off of the internet, which is nice. They've got down below the title of the course, the slot, the date the experiment was performed, and I blacked it out, but the names of the two students who wrote this report. Again, if you write the report yourself um, independently, you would put your name first and then your partner's name after that. Next came their abstract. Now, in this higher level course, the abstract is a bit more um, detailed. They go into a lot more detail in terms of the background theory in, that was used in this experiment. But if we were to take time to read this, we would find a description of the background, we would find the purpose of the experiment, then we would find description of the, of the procedure, not a step-by-step -step recipe, but a but a summary of the, of the procedure, and finally at the end of the conclusion would come the results. The percent copper in the brass was 60.7%. Um, if there was a class set of results, they would also include the class average there. Data tables come next, and results tables, and again the tables are labeled with the titles, they're nicely formatted, the units are included in the tables, um, it's very, very attractive looking and informative. Now below that, a second table of data, this time with some, uh, with some uh, results mixed in, some calculations of concentration. Now some lab reports, you'll also be required to include a graph. Not all reports, but in some, and it'll be clear, clearly told to you up front. Now a good, a good graph, like this one, has a clear title. So Beer's Law Plot for Copper II Sulfate at 635 nanometers. That may not mean much to you, but to a chemistry student, that's a very clear descriptive title. Next, we look at the axes of the graph, and the x-axis has a clear title, concentration of copper II sulfate with its units. These are molarity as units. And on the y-axis, the absorbance of copper II sulfate, if absorbance actually has no units, so they didn't put the units down there. The axes also have nice scales on them. The scales here were probably chosen or probably made for them using Microsoft Excel, a computer program. And here's the x-axis scale, very nice as well. Their graph data are clearly pointed, and they've included a line best fit here because the data looked pretty much linear. Now, you can, I'm not going to zoom out here, but another nice thing about this graph is that the, the graph itself takes up about two-thirds of the entire graph paper. So you have a graph that's large and filling out most of the graph paper, which is nice to see. So there's a good looking graph. The next section of their report, they've got sample calculations, calculations for each of the results earlier. And again, the calculations are labeled as to what they're calculating. They're using unit multipliers in their calculations, so they don't have formulas and they've got the results labeled there with the units and paid attention to significant digits as well. Down below, here's a second calculation with a description of what they're calculating. This time they are using a formula, so they wrote the formula. They rearranged the formula algebraically, put the numbers in, and showed me a calculation for one of the results in their table earlier. And then finally comes the conclusion of, of their experiment. And again, this is a grade 11 advanced chemistry class. The conclusion is pretty in-depth. These students wrote about a page and a quarter for their conclusion. But if we were to read this, we would find, again, a statement of their results, 
um, a statement, of, a comparison of those results to actual percent copper in brass. They got this from uh, Wikipedia, if I recall. I think they got a reference at the back. And then a description of the errors that might have occurred in their experiment. So how each error might affect the, the result. Would it cause the result to be too high or too low? So there is a very, very nice looking uh, lab report from grade 11 in Mass Chemistry, but you can see with the same basic components that we would use in grade 9 advanced science. So I hope that helps in terms of constructing your first lab reports or maybe your second or third lab report. Um, good luck and ask questions in class if there's something that's uh, not clear to you about this process.